Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin McGarrigal, and I am the coordinator and principal instructor for the National Advanced Civil Cultural Program, or NASP, uh, Module 3 uh, on Landscape Ecology. And I'm preparing this video as pre training in the use of the software program R and its graphical user interface, R Studio so that students in the NASP program can come to the NASP course in January held in Flagstaff every year for that year's uh, NASP cohort, <clears throat> can come prepared to use R in support of several of the lab projects. Now, to begin, let me say that this is not a comprehensive uh, course in the use of R, but rather just the bare bones essentials for what you'll need to know to kind of survive our NASP landscape ecology module and the use of R in support of some of the lab projects. With that being said, let's get started. <clears throat> so I'm assuming that each of you watching this video will be working on a laptop and will have already installed R and R Studio as per the instructions that I sent out uh, previously. So assuming you have both R and R Studio installed on your computer, let's go ahead and begin by opening up R Studio. And depending upon how you did the installation, you may find it under your pro under your start menu by clicking in the bottom left and finding R Studio uh, somewhere in your list, presumably under the R's. And there's a drop down uh, menu on the left here, and then clicking on the R Studio button. You may have also installed a desktop uh, button uh, to open R Studio, which I do not have one on my desktop. I have R, but not R Studio, and we'll talk about the difference in just a sec. But I do have an R Studio uh, button on the bottom here. So depending on how you installed R Studio, go ahead and open the program. And assuming that uh, everything installed correctly, you should have a window that looks something like this. Now yours may look a little different and I'll describe why that might be the case in just a minute. <clears throat> but first, let's give a little bit of background on R and R Studio for those that are new to this software environment. First, R is the actual software uh, that will be running in the background and R Studio is merely a graphical user interface that provides uh, some efficient uh, functionality in terms of accessing R and all its power. So we will be using R in the background, but we will be accessing it through this user interface that is, is, is our studio. Now R is an open source freeware program, and that means that it's free, of course, and it's open source, meaning anyone has access to the source code and can offer to make changes to that source code to benefit all the other uh, worldwide users, assuming it meets certain minimum standards. The power of R is that you have literally many thousands of users, many of them very skilled developers, who are developing um, packages that we'll talk about later and functions within those packages to do all sorts of interesting uh, computer processing tasks. Uh, and those become readily available to any other R user. So instead of having proprietary software, which is dependent upon you know, the proprietors to determine what goes in the software, essentially the users decide what goes in this software. And because you have many thousands of users developing new uh, programs that do new and interesting and state-of-the-art things, R is an amazing platform for having access to all the latest and greatest uh, computer processing um, uh, programs that, that one might be interested in. Now I'll also mention that R is probably the leading uh, program of its type in the natural sciences. And in contrast to other programs such as MATLAB, which have similar um, processing capabilities and functionality, that are quite expensive to purchase and require you know, a lot of advanced training in its use, R and, and, and programs like RStudio are relatively quick to learn 
And then once you master this, again, you have access to an, an almost infinite number of, of packages and programs that do all sorts of things that uh, you might be interested in uh, within the field of natural sciences. <clears throat> so that's a real brief background on R. Our studio was developed uh, by some individuals that wanted to make uh, accessibility and usability of R uh, greater uh, to allow uh, people who are maybe less computer program oriented um, have access to the power of R. And so as you'll see, um, this interface allows us to, to do a lot of things very efficiently and in a nice graphical environment to display results and so forth that in R is, is much more cumbersome. So R Studio, which we're seeing on the screen now, is again a graphical user interface and it has a number of components uh, that I'll try to briefly explain uh, without going into detail on, on really any of them. But the first thing you should notice when you open up our studio is that there are these various partitions to the screen. And I think the default is that you'll have these three partitions, one on the left and two on the right. It's possible that yours, when you first install and open it for the first time, will have a different number and arrangement of these partitions, but those can all be changed. For example, you can take any one of these windows and put your cursor on the line separating the window and you can stretch you know, or compress each window to meet your, your needs. We can also learn in just a minute on what we put in each side of these windows. Now, this window on the left, you'll notice up on the top left here is called the console. And you'll notice down here with the blinking cursor and this uh, greater than sign, that is the symbol for the cursor. And that is where you would typically type in a line of code and then hit enter to execute that line of code. And then the results will be returned back to the console. For example, if we put our cursor here and we click here to make sure that's where we actually are. And let's say we just type two plus two and then hit enter. You notice that we get the result and the result is four. And this number in the square brackets on the left just means it's the first item in this object that was returned. And, it, and because it completed this command successfully, we get back to the cursor. And so we're ready to do another line uh, depending upon what we might want to do. So this is the console window. And this is a very important window because this is where all the, the things that you want to do in R actually get executed and where the tabular results get returned back to the screen. Now, if we were to call for a plot, we'll see in a minute that the plots will be displayed in one of these other windows over on the right. Now, in most cases, when we're working in R, rather than typing in the console the lines of code that we want to execute and having the results return back to that console, we typically work in a window known as the source window. And by default, the source window is not open here. We have to create one. And so we're going to do that by, on the left here, either going to File and say um, New File, and then come over and say R Script. That's one way to do it. Or we can just take the shortcut here and just take this uh, button here that has the, the white um, sheet with the plus sign and click on that. And it'll give you a drop down menu. And there's various types of files we might open in the source window. And we're not really going to talk about any of these except for the first one, the R script. So click on R script. And what you should notice is we opened up a fourth window. So the window on the left, which was previously just the console, has now been divided into the source window on the top and the console window on the bottom. And the two windows over here on the right have not changed. Now, this source window is where we would typically type in code. So for example, if we type in 2 plus 2 up here, OK, this is where we write our code or what we refer to as script. These are the lines of our code or script that we would that we eventually want to execute by sending to the console 
and having the results returned either to the console or to a plot window or some other device that we might tell it to in, in our script. So up here we put in two by two plus two. If I hit enter, notice I didn't I didn't send it to the console, so we didn't get the result four. All we got was a new line. In this case, it's a blank line because we haven't actually run anything. All we are doing up here is writing code, writing script. To execute that script, we actually have to have the cursor on the line we want to run. And then there's multiple ways to do it, but the easiest way is to use this run button, which you see where my cursor is at this point. And if I hit that, and you notice if you hold the cursor over it, it'll tell you what it's going to do. It says run the current line or selection. In this case, I only have a single line of code, so it's going to run the one line. Now, if we hit run, you'll notice that it sent that line down to the cursor, I mean the console, as if we had typed it in the console. And then, of course, accordingly, it returned the result to four, and we got a new cursor back, the greater than symbol. So what we did up here was equivalent to typing in the console. The difference being, when we type things into the console, we're not really saving that script. That's like a one-time deal. If you want to just run a single line once and be done with it, you can just type it right into the console. But typically when we're working in R, we want to have a record of everything we do for lots of reasons. Uh, but most importantly, because oftentimes we want to repeat that code and do it many different times, and we want to evaluate the results and then maybe make changes. And so we store that code in a script. So up here, this two plus two is now stored up here in this script. We haven't saved it yet, but we can easily save this. And the next time we come back into our studio, we can open up this script and have all of the code that we have previously run ready to run again or ready to edit and, and run uh, for a different type of run. So if you are programming in R, this is where you would program. You would open up a script window and you'd type in R code to do the things you want it to do and then you'd save it. Now in this course, we are not gonna be writing any R code. All of that R code that we're gonna be using, I have written for you in advance because clearly this is not a course in R and it's not that relevant for us in this course to learn how to program in R. What we wanna do is be a competent user of R. So instead of typing in the script window, the lines, I'm gonna just uh, delete the line that we had typed in there. And instead, we're going to open up a script that I have already saved in advance for you. So for this, again, there's different ways to do it. We can go to File and Open, or we can just use the toolbar button here with the little open folder. And if I click on that, it's going to open up a navigation window. And you should navigate to the directory on your laptop where you have saved the script file that I sent in my email. So for me, I am navigating down to a folder that contains this script. And you'll see in my case, it's, in, it's on the C drive in the work directory, the Land Eco subdirectory, exercises subdirectory, lab one subdirectory, and then finally the scripts subdirectory. So it's nested down in one, two, three, four, five levels down. And for this course, we're going to have a similar structure like this where we put all of our data and each of our lab exercises will have its own folder and there'll be scripts um, for each of the labs that we'll be running. For today, in our, in our, in our, uh, our little demonstration today, we don't have to worry about all that. Right now, what's important is wherever you downloaded the script that I attached to my email announcing this video, navigate to that folder. And in that folder, you should find this file called createlanddefs.r. And if you select that by just clicking, excuse me, not that one, sorry, I meant, I meant lab1.r, the lab1.r folder. Now you may have some other files in that folder or not. So don't, don't be too worried that you see create land defs.r in mine and you don't have that because I did not send that file to you. But you should have the lab1.r. Lab Go ahead and hit open. Now what you should see is all of a sudden in the source window, we got all kinds of code or script. 
And you'll see if you go to the top and then scroll to the bottom, you see we have a total of 53 lines of code, a lot of them blank, and many of them commented out. But these are the lines of code that we're going to run in lab one of our NASP landscape ecology course. Now, this script window contains the script and the individual lines that we'll run. And you'll notice that many of them are this light green color because they begin with this hashtag. And that's a comment line. So if I have my cursor on that line that has a comment on it and I try to say run, nothing, oops, sorry, it skips, it skips over those comment lines and runs the next active line, which in this script you'll see is uh, this line beginning with the word source. We don't need to run that yet because we have to talk about a few other things before we actually start working with this script. For now, what's important is to understand that we have a source window, which contains the script, the lines of code that we're going to run. We have a console window, which is where those lines will get sent and executed. And then the results will get returned either back to the console or to a plot window. Okay, and then over on the right, we have two other windows. Let's take a minute to talk about these other two windows. Now, your initial installation of RStudio may have windows that look a little different than this because you'll notice in these windows there's some tabs. In my case, I have a tab called Environment, History, and Connections in my upper window. And in my bottom window, I actually have five tabs files, plots, packages, help, and viewer. Now, don't worry about the fact that you may have different tabs in these different windows. We can change which things show up in each of these windows very easily uh, by going to the tools on the top menu here, tools. And if we go down to the bottom here to global options, and we click on that, it opens up a window that allows you to set all kinds of defaults for how our studio works and what you see when you open up our studio. And if you go down to the pane layout button here on the left, you'll see that it shows you you have four potential windows. The top left is the source window. And that is typically what you're going to want to have in the top left. Although some people uh, put the console on the top left and the source in the bottom left. It's a personal preference thing. But we need to have a source window and we need to have a console window. Source being where we're going to run our scripts and the console where we're going to actually execute and, and look at some of the tabular results. The real variation is on the right here. And you'll see on my upper right, I have checked the tabs that I want to have um, access to in the upper right window. For our purposes right now, it doesn't really matter what you have checked. Um, you might want to have environment checked. Um, and you might want to really just have environment checked is the only one that we might be interested in. You can leave the others unchecked or you can check them. Uh, it really doesn't matter for our purposes. The bottom, bottom, um, again, you have the same options and you don't need to have the same thing checked in two windows, right? You only need, uh, like environment, only needs to be checked in one of the windows, not both. And down on the bottom, I have checked files, plots, packages, help, and viewer, because of these are things that I sometimes use while I'm working in R. For our purposes, really the most important thing for you to have is files, plots, packages, and help. And with those tabs and environment in the upper right, and then of course with our source and console, you should be good to go with everything that we're going to do in this class, and then some. So let's say OK, or apply and then OK, and that, if you made any changes, will restructure your, your RStudio um, interface. Now, in the upper right, you'll notice I have these three tabs, and the one we're going to focus on here is environment. And the environment shows you what things you've already loaded into memory and you have access to in terms of functions, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, to work with in R. 
And as we work in R, we'll look at this environment because it'll change as we as we do more things in R. More things will show up in our in our R environment. That means those are things that we actually have already generated through an R script or have access in terms of functions to run things. Again, this will become more clear as we as we start working. In the bottom, notice it's blank right now, if because I have it on the viewer tab. If I go over here to files. It's going to come up with essentially a navigation window that should show you the structure of your hard drive. And you can navigate uh, to find the files that you're interested in. So this is one way basically to navigate and to find files that you might be want to open. So for example, if I want to open an R script, I could navigate to the directory that has it here and then select the file and open it, and it would open it up in this R script. We, we generally won't be using this files tab to do any navigation because it won't really be necessary in our in our lab projects. We will however be using the plot window and if you click on that it should be blank right now because we haven't actually created any plots but we will in just a sec. Uh, the next tab is a very important one and it's called packages and packages in R are, are sets of functions that individual contributors to R have prepared to do various things. Now, when you installed R in R Studio, there's a whole bunch of packages that, that get installed for you by default. These are the base packages that come with every R installation. And they do a lot of the basic things that many people want to do. But as soon as you start working in R, and as soon as you start doing any kind of custom analytical work, you quickly find that the base packages are not sufficient. And there are hundreds, literally hundreds of other packages that have been written and developed by other users within the R community and have been then made available uh, in the, through the R project for you to have access to those packages and all their functions. And so if you look at your list of packages and you scroll down, you may have 10 or 15 packages that were installed. I have I don't know, I probably have 50 or 60 packages that I've installed uh, for doing various things in, in my research program. We're gonna look at these packages and, and some of the functions they do in a minute, but for right now, let's just uh, move on and look at the help tab. The help tab, if you click on that, is where you learn about each of the packages and each of the functions contained within those packages um, to give you information about how to correctly call that function, what that function is doing for you when you do call it, um, what the results should look like, and so forth. So the help window over here is an incredibly valuable resource uh, for folks who are writing our script and using functions that are contained in one or more of these packages. Now, the viewer is a way to view data sets when you open them, where we actually probably will not use this, so let's not worry too much about the viewer, but it, it's just a quick way to look at a data set um, and have access to it. So right now I'm gonna leave this tab on the packages, I mean, yeah, leave this tab on the packages tab for now. Okay, so let's review uh, where we are. At this point, we understand that RStudio is a graphical environment. It comes initially with three windows, but when we open up a source window, it divides the first window into two, so we end up with four windows. And they each allow us to do different things. The source window allows us to type in or run exist pre-existing scripts that actually tell R to do stuff we want it to do. There's a console window where the actual code gets executed and error messages and tabular results get reported back to the console. The upper right window, we have currently the environment tab set, and that tells us what kinds of information are stored in memory and that we have access to. That'll become clear in a minute. And the bottom window is where we can look at plots, we can look at the packages and the functions in those packages, we can go to help and learn about the individual functions and packages and so forth. Okay. So one other thing to notice in the graphical user interface is there's a toolbar up here in the top. And this toolbar allows you to do a lot of things. 
and most of them have drop down menus. So if I click on edit, for example, we'll get this large drop down menu of things you might want to do. If I go to uh, the tools, as we did previously, you'll see there's a bunch of things here, installing new packages, checking for package updates, and the global options where we change the display characteristics of RStudio, lots of things. So there's lots of things you can do uh, by looking at the toolbars, the toolbar and the drop down menus. But for now, we don't have time or really the interest to go through all of these, uh, these uh, abilities. We'll, we'll use them as we need to, as we, as we learn and use R and RStudio. So for now, let's, uh, let's talk about this script that we loaded and what it represents. It represents a bunch of lines of code that tell R to do something, to take some input, to process it in some way, and to produce some output. And one of the things we typically do in R is we use functions to, that have been developed by some other developer and incorporated into a package to facilitate the work we want to do. Now, a package is, is nothing more than a collection of functions. And usually there's a theme to that package. That package is all about doing regression modeling. That package is all about working with rasters or grids uh, and so forth and so on. So each package has a theme developed either by one of the um, R project developers or some other developer in the R community that has developed a package and made it available to the R community. <clears throat> each package contains a set of functions. In a function, is nothing more than a bunch of code that has been packaged up into a, into a chunk of code, put into what's called a function. And that function says, take this input, do this processing to the input, and produce this output. And of course, every function is unique because each function has a different purpose. Uh, to perhaps taking a different kind of input, doing a different process of that input, and producing a different kind of output. And there's literally, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of functions that are packaged together into these packages that are available for you to use. Now for our lab, we're gonna actually work with two packages or package-like packages. One of them is a set of functions that I wrote specifically for our work in this course and some additional functions for work in my lab and other courses that I teach. And it's a package that is called Landico. And this package, landico.r, is something that you, you have downloaded from the email that I sent to you. And you presumably have put it in a folder, possibly in the same place as the lab1.r folder. And what we need to do is load that package into memory so that we can access the functions that are in that package. Now, there's a little trick, little um, uh, idiosyncrasy about landeco.r package. It's actually not a formal package in the R world that, that users worldwide have access to simply because I developed this solely for use in my own course classes, in my own lab. It's really not intended to be used by other people outside my lab. So you can't really access it the same way you do other packages in ours because it's not available um, in the R community. So instead of uh, the way we would normally install and load a package, we're gonna use a, a function in R called source. And you'll notice I've highlighted source over here on the left. And that is the way we basically run a bunch of code that has been packaged together. In this case, it's been packaged together into a script I call landeco.r. And we're going to run that code. And for you, for you folks, you'll have to edit this line right here, this directory, to wherever you installed the landeco.r file that was attached to your email. Now, you may want to pause this video 
if you need to go find this directory and figure out where this is, and then resume it once you've figured out your directory structure. But in most cases, it'll be something like C colon, and then notice instead of a single backslash, I have a double backslash, and then whatever your directory structure is, finishing with the file name landeco.r. And notice the whole thing is either in single quotes or double quotes. In R, you can use either single quotes or double quotes. You just need to pair them. So if you use a single quote to start, you need to use a single quote to finish. And all we're doing here is enclosing in quotes, single quotes in this case, the entire path to the landeco.r script, which is a pseudo package that I have prepared for our coursework. And if we get this path structure right, and, and we run this source function, it will load all the functions that I have prepared in this package into memory in R. So let's go ahead and run that line by putting your cursor anywhere on the line. And notice, my cursor doesn't have to be at the beginning or the end or any place in between. It can be anywhere on this line. If I prefer, I can even block select this line with my mouse. All of those are equivalent. You just need to have your mouse or the selection on that line somewhere and then hit run by clicking the run button up here. And if assuming you got your path structure right, you'll notice it sent that line down to the console here at the bottom. Notice this line has just been transferred down to the console and then executed. And because it worked, we don't see any red error messages. It simply returned the console, the greater than sign down here at the bottom which means everything worked fine. Now what happened is when we sourced this landeco.r package or pseudo package, it loaded into memory a whole bunch of functions. Now what you should have noticed is when you ran that line over here in your environment window, all of these things showed up. All of these functions showed up. Okay, you should have a long list of th things over here called functions. And those are different functions that are in the landeco.r pseudo package. Each one of those functions does something different. We won't talk about the details of what these functions do because that's something specific to our particular lab project. Uh, but when we use a function, we'll talk about what it's supposed to do. But I can tell you right now, each of these functions takes some input, does some processing, and produces some output. It just, they each have a slightly different objective in terms of what they're trying to do. Okay, so at this point, we have loaded the landeco.r pseudo package. Now we want to load a formal package. This is a package that was developed by one or more users, or one or more developers, and they made it available to all our users through the R project. This package we're going to use is a graphics package, and it's called ggplot2. And the way you load that package is with the library command. So by running this line, we would load this package and all its functions, functions into memory, and then we would be able to use them in our script. Now, by default, you will not have this library installed on your computer. So you'll have to first install this library, and that's very easy to do, assuming you uh, have an internet connection. To do that, the simplest way is to go over here to your Packages tab in your lower right window. And you'll notice that there's a button here called Install. If you click on that install button, it should open up this little dialog box. And there's a couple things to pay attention to. The first, it says install from. And by default, it should come up with this repository CRAN. If you click the drop down, you'll see that another option is to install this package from an archived file in one of uh, a few different formats, like a zip or tar or gz format. We will not be using the archive file approach. We will be installing from the repository. The CRAN repository is, is simply a server, a computer server somewhere in the world. And there are dozens of these at mo many major universities and other uh, research institutions have computer servers. And each of these CRAN servers has a complete duplicate copy of the R software and all of the packages that are available for our users. So they are essentially mirror images of each other. The point of having different servers, different CRAN 
repositories is to spread the workload among many institutions instead of uh, putting it all on one server. So in this case, if you leave it on repository CRAN, uh, and, and we don't have to choose a repository right now, um, if you do, you'd hit this configure repositories and then pick one of the repositories, but I believe it'll come up with a default and you can just go with that. What we wanna do next is down here in the packages uh, box, click your mouse in there, and we wanna start typing in ggplot2. G, notice they type G and all the libraries that begin, or packages that begin with a G start coming up. GG, it starts limiting them. GGP, let's see. Each time we add a letter, it, it reduces the selection to just the packages that, you know, are consistent with those, that, that set of characters. So as we continue, whoops, as we continue, ggplot, you can see there's a bunch of different varieties of ggplot. We're interested in ggplot2, and so we would select ggplot2. So now this says install ggplot2 from one of the CRAN repositories, one of the servers somewhere in the world, and install it to a directory on your hard disk. And for now, it's probably safest for you just to leave the default directory there. Um, more advanced users might want to install packages in, in, in custom locations, but for your purposes, you can just install these packages in the default location. And very importantly, make sure this next box at the bottom is checked. That says install dependencies. It means when we install ggplot2, that package, if it itself depends upon other packages, it will install those packages for you. So that when you run ggplot2 functions, it will have all the necessary information it needs to run those functions. So go ahead and click the install button and it should process. I'll go ahead and do it, even though I already have it installed, but I don't think it can hurt me to install it again. It's downloading the file from the CRAN server, and you'll notice down here on the console, it, it gives you some information in red here, what it's doing, and then in the end, hopefully it says that it was successfully unpacked, and the MD5 sums were checked, and, and that tells you where it was loaded to, and you get the cursor back. Now that means everything worked fine and we now have access to ggplot2. So assuming that worked for you, and let's hope it did, if it didn't, we'll have to resolve that problem in person in Flagstaff. But let's assume it did work. Now if you go to your bottom right window where you have the packages tab selected, we should be able to scroll down now to G, the G's, and find that ggplot2 now shows up. And you can see what the description is. It creates elegant, it's create elegant data visualizations using the grammar of graphics. We don't have to worry about that. It just allows you to do some pretty fancy plotting. And a lot of people are using ggplot to do you know, publication level plots. If we check this box next to ggplot, okay, and then click on it, it's gonna open up some description of the package and a whole list of all the functions that are in that package. As you scroll down and they're in alphabetical order, you're gonna see there's a whole lot of functions, each one of these in this list. So if we go to any one of them, let's say this geom underscore raster, if I click on that, that is a function in the ggplot2 package. And you notice here, it automatically opened up the help file for that function. And it says here in the upper left, geom underscore raster, that's the function. And then inside the uh, squiggly uh, parens, it says ggplot2. That means this is the geom raster function in the ggplot2 package of functions. And then there's a description of that function. Well, this is what it does. Here's how you use it. So here's you know the, the, the arguments of the function and what has to be specified in order to use that function tells you a little bit about each of these uh, arguments that go into this function and gives you some examples on how to use it, which you could actually run yourself to get more familiar with it. And each one of the functions in R, in one of the R packages, has a help file that looks generally similar to this. And so you can learn a lot about these functions by essentially just 
clicking on that function and, and opening up its corresponding help file. Okay, so now let's go back over to our script. We now have loaded into memory all the functions in the landeco.r pseudo package and in the ggplot2 formal package. All of those things should now be over here in functions as available for you. In fact, I take that back. Uh, the, 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 the functions in landeco r that we sourced show up over here in the environment. The functions available from ggplot2 don't get listed here, but they are actually available to you. They're just hidden uh, because it's a formal uh, r package. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, let's go down the script a little bit to this first, uh, this next line that's not commented. It's line number 22. Let's put our cursor on that line for right now. And let, let's go ahead and run that line first. And again, as usual, we'll notice that when we hit run, it sends that line down to the console, down at the bottom, which you can see is here. And, and it did something and then returned the console, I mean, returned the cursor. Now, what did it do is a little bit tricky, but um, real briefly, this line here says, let's, let's create an object called infile. And this left arrow, which is just the less than sign and the dash combined, says, let's put into this object that we're calling infile the following. And in this case, we put, we put in a character string. It's in quotes, single quotes. Again, it could be double quotes, doesn't really matter. And you can see what it is. It's a path starting from the C drive all the way to a file that's called fragout.land. And the fragout.land file is a file that exists on disk that I sent to you in that email. Now, one thing you'll have to do is change this path structure to be the same path that the path that takes you to this fragout.lan. So presumably, it's going to be the same path where you put landeco.r and the same path where you put the lab1.r script. Presumably, you put them all in the same directory and you simply need to repeat that directory here. And what that will do is say, let's, let's read this directory and this file, okay? Let's, and let's put that directory structure and file name into an object called infile. Now, this is, I'm not really sure how important it is for you to understand this object-oriented approach for our lab purposes, but real briefly, R is an object-oriented language, which basically means that everything, packets of information get stored as what are called objects. And an object is really nothing more than a named part of the memory in your computer. And by naming that memory, that object, you can then call that object, use that object in operations. And so all we've done here is we've created an object by assigning this character string to this object that is a named part of your memory on your computer that's called infile. So you can think of that now as just a, a file, an object that's called infile. And really all that is is this character string. And the reason that's important is because in R, we're always kind of creating objects to hold our data, for example, or to hold um, text strings like we have in this case, and other um, outputs in, uh, outputs from functions that we've run. We, we basically store that information, whether it's input information or output information in objects. And we do that by assigning the information we want to store to a file name. And if, we, and if we use a new file name, we're creating a new object. If we use a file name that already exists, we're overwriting that object. But the arrow says we're taking this information on the right and we're, we're moving it into this object on the left, the direction of the arrow. So if we run that line, once you have fixed this path, and notice we've used double backslashes again, not single. R requires that, 
or you can use a single forward slash. Either case, doesn't matter. In our case, I've just kept the backslash convention and then double backslashed it. And if we run that line, okay, we have in file as an object. And notice it, it, it sent it down to the cursor, to the console, and the cursor was returned. And if you notice up here in the environment in the upper right, now all of a sudden we have this new category called values, and we have this new object in file. And this is the first part of what's in that object. In this case, it's the complete contents of that object. As we create objects, they will show up here in our environment. And that means you know that they're stored in memory by those names, and you can use them in functions below. So right now, what we have in memory is a whole bunch of functions, and we have one object called infile. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run a function, okay? It's this function called fraglandbarplot. And that is a function that you can find over here under functions. If you scroll down, fragland bar plot. There it is, fragland bar plot. So that is a function that I wrote and included in the landeco.r package. And this particular function has a bunch of arguments. And if you hold your cursor over the function, it should show you some of the information that goes into that function. And for our purposes, we don't need to care about most of what goes, in, goes into that function in terms of arguments. All we need to know at this point is that this function requires us to specify an input file that contains the information we need. In this case, it's gonna be some data that we generated for one of our, for our first lab project. And that is gonna be stored in this file up here called fragout.land. And the way you get to that file is through this path all of which is stored in this object called infile. So we have to tell where and what file to, to get the appropriate input data. That's, called, that's in infile. And then one other little idiosyncrasy in this function that is detailed we don't have to worry too much about. It's like it, it has to do with where in this data set is the information we want to plot for this particular function. And, and again, that is information we don't have to worry about for this demonstration because it's more specific to the lab exercise. And when we get to the lab exercise, of course, we'll, we'll talk about these things in more detail. But for right now, let's just see if we can run that function. Again, I could put my cursor anywhere on this line, or I could block select the whole line and hit the run button. Now, if everything worked well, you should see that it sent this line down to the console, as always, and we also, got, uh, instead of getting the cursor back down here, we got press enter for next plot. And that means that this function is not done yet. It's not done until we get the cursor back. It means it has more to do. In this case, it says, hey, press enter on your, on your keyboard and you'll get another plot. In this case, we're gonna get a different plot for each of several landscape metrics, and we'll learn about those in the class. Uh, and we're gonna look at what these metrics tell us about these different landscapes, which in this plot on the, on the lower right window uh, is, is on the Y axis here. Each one of these rows is a different landscape. And we'll learn about what those are and why they're different in, in the class. And it's just producing a bar plot showing the value of this metric, NP stands for number of patches, for this particular landscape, and you see the variation in the number of patches across landscapes and the scale for NP number of patches is on the bottom here. The details of this plot absolutely do not matter for our demonstration today. All we care about right now is we ran a function whose purpose is to create a plot from some data that we provided. And it sent that plot to the plot window, which should be in your lower right window at this point. Now, because it says plus enter for next plot, we have to make sure our cursor is down in the console window. So just clicking down here and then hit the enter. And you'll notice it came up with a new plot. And it says press enter for the next plot. So we can just keep hitting enter and we'll get a new plot, a different plot for each one of these landscape metrics. Now let's say we're tired of scrolling through plots and we want to do something else. One quick way to get out of this function 
because we have not finished the function, because we're not back to a cursor, is to hit the escape button. If you hit the escape button, it will drop you out of that function and get you back to the cursor. So anytime you get stuck in a function or something doesn't look right, hit the escape, you get back to the cursor, and we can fix the problem and start over again. Um, let's say you've produced a plot and you like that plot for whatever reason. And let's say you want to save that plot and put it in your lab report or to put it in your PowerPoint presentation. There's lots of ways to do it, but the simplest way that will work for you guys in class is come over here to your plot window and you'll notice there's this export button. If you hit export, you have some options, save it as an image or save it as a PDF. You can copy it to your clipboard and put it into PowerPoint directly that way. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, if you hit save as image, it's gonna come up with this window that shows you the image. You can have different formats, TIFFs, JPEGs, PNGs, you know, your preference, it doesn't really matter. You can change the, the, the dimensions. Um, you can choose where you want to put it with this directory button. You can change the, the, you can put the name of the plot you want to put it and so forth. Um, I'm going to cancel right now because I don't want to save this plot. But let's say you have a PowerPoint presentation open already and you're just storing images that you might want to use. What's quicker is just to go to export and say copy to clipboard. It'll open up the same window and just say copy plot, go to your PowerPoint and paste it and, you, and you're done. So that's, that's the quick and easy way of, of, once you have a plot that you think you want to use, just saving it and putting it into a PowerPoint presentation or saving it to hard disk if you want to save the image permanently. Um, okay, let's say we have gone through this script and perhaps you've made some changes. In this case, you won't really need to make changes, but in some of the lab exercises, you will make some changes to the script. In your case, in fact, you have made some changes. You've changed this path probably, unless you created the same path on your hard disk as, as my path, but you would have changed that line and you would have also changed it here as well. You would have changed those two lines. So you have made some changes to this script. Now, let's say you wanna save this script so the next time you open it up, all of your edits and so forth have been saved. That's very easy to do with up here, you, there's different ways to do it, but um, if you've made some changes, this save button or disk here will be active. Mine's not active because I haven't made any changes. I could, I, could, um, all, I could just force the save by going to file and then down to save, but again, I haven't made any changes, but yours will be active. So you can hit save here, or you can come back here and hit the little blue disk on the left here and hit save the current document, and it will save that file and overwrite that file by the same name. Now, if you have, uh, in my case, this untitled script, the very first script that we opened up where we did the two plus two, let's say I had the two plus two in here still. Let's say I wanted to save that. Notice the save uh, button is active. So I could hit save, and I could navigate to where I wanna save it, and I could put the name in here, so I could say, in this case, junk, and maybe I want to put the extension .r, so I personally know that that's an R script file on my hard disk, and I could hit save. Now that is saved as junk.r, and I can always go open it up. All right, um, I think that covers the bare bones essentials for working in R, or for working in R Studio to access the functionality of R. I suppose uh, a review of some of the key things we've learned uh, is warranted. Uh, first, remember that R Studio is just a graphical user interface that accesses the program R, which is running in the background here. Uh, remember that you have four windows to work with. You're always gonna have, or generally always gonna have a script window, the source window, usually in the upper left, which is where you either write script or you run pre-existing script. In your case, you'll be running pre-existing script that I've provided for you for each lab. You're gonna have a console window where everything gets executed. You'll have a window on the right, upper right, which has potentially several optional tabs, but most importantly, the environment that will show you the objects that are in memory that you can use. 
Most of this you won't need to uh, be that familiar with, um, but there may be a time where you need to know if something is still stored in memory and you can look over here and see if it's there. And then in the bottom, most importantly, we'll have our plot window for displaying plots. We'll have our packages window where we can install and load packages to, to use the functions in those packages. And very importantly, you have the help window where you can learn about each of those functions. You'll be basically running from a pre-existing script and the one we use today was called lab1.r. And typically, well, remember that there'll, off, there'll always be commented lines that begin with one or more hashtags. Uh, lines without that are going to be lines of valid script that, that you actually want to run. And generally, we're creating objects or running functions in the script. And generally, these scripts will begin by loading the necessary packages that we have the functions that we want to work with. In every lab, you'll always be loading my landeco.r package or pseudo package. And it gets loaded a little differently using, it gets loaded using the source function instead of the library function, because that's literally just loading, sending, uh, loading, loading all of the script that's contained in this landeco.r file. Whereas the library command is actually formally loading an R package that has been previously installed. If you have a library here that you're trying to load that has not been installed, you get an error message. And you'll simply need to come over here to the packages window, go to the install button, and with the repository CRAN selected in the top, type in the package name, make sure the install dependencies is checked, which it should be by default, hit install. It will crank away for a while, and once it's installed, you can then run the library function to load all of those functions into memory. And then the script will have uh, a variety of things, typically. Sometimes we're creating objects, which we did in this first line. We created an object called infile, which is nothing more than this character string, telling it where and what file to grab that has the data we want. And then there'll be one or more function calls. In this case, what we ran was a function called fragland bar plot, and we supplied two arguments to that function in file, which tells us where and what file we want to use that has the data, and then another argument that is not important to us that tells us where specific variables in that file were that we want to plot. And then when we ran that function, it sent plots over here to the plot window. We can save those by using the export button over here and copying them to clipboard and then pasting them into our PowerPoint or into our Word document. Or we can save them to file as an image or as a PDF. And once we're done creating plots with this function, if we are done, we'll get the cursor. So if I go through all of the plots, we'll finish with the cursor. Or I can escape uh, and get out of that function uh, prematurely. If you see information in, uh, in the console in red, which I didn't talk about previously, sometimes it is warning messages and you have to kind of be experienced to know whether you can ignore them or not. In this case, we can't ignore them. But when you have error messages, they will show up here as red and that will tell you and me that something went wrong and then of course we'll fix it and, and make things all work. Um, so that's it. I hope this is enough to give you general familiarity with the R environment so that when we get to class, we'll basically be ready in our first lab to do a very quick uh, review of R in our studio and be ready to, to start working on the actual lab exercises. All right, uh, good luck, folks, uh, with your training here in R in our studio. And uh, I look forward to working with you in our studio, uh, in our project, our exercises uh, in Flagstaff uh, in January. Take care.